Yeah, amen. <laughs> we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to take your Bibles. Go to John. I'm gonna preach on longevity. No. <laughs> amen. John chapter 14. I prayed about this, and this is what the Lord told me to preach. So, this is what I'm preaching. It'll be short. You don't believe that, but it probably will be. Not as they're singing. It used to be longer, but I was complaining about them not doing four, and I settled for three. You get a little eleven, eleven the whole lump, and then they go down to two. Pretty soon they'll uh, they'll they'll give us a CD and tell us just to stick it in, and they'll be done with it. Uh, John chapter fourteen, verse one says, "Let not your hearts be troubled." You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that, there, that where uh, I am there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. Thank you for the singing. Uh, thank you for the, the, every, everything you've given us already this morning. Thank you for just a place to come to. And thank you most of all for a book and our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless the morning service. And Father, we'll praise you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. You may be seated. I was sitting there praying. And I said, Lord, I, I, I need to know what to preach. I need to know what to preach. And this kept coming up on my mind. Uh, and then all of a sudden, three points just popped out right there, and it's a little different. I, I preached on this passage before, but it says, let not your heart be troubled. And the title of this message is Troublesome Times. We're in some troublesome times right now that uh, is really uh, that same thing probably the Lord was in back in the day that he was in. Probably the same thing down through history that all of our brothers and sisters in Christ have been through. Uh, you go through the Dark Ages from 500 to uh, 1500 B.C., or B.C., <laughs> Uh, 5 A.D., and, and you see all kinds of stuff. Fox's Book of Martyrs, people were being killed left and right. Troublesome times are all over the place, and, and we've just been shielded, really, from a lot of that, and, and we've been so used to having everything and being a very wealthy nation and rich that uh, we've been shielded from some of that, but there are troublesome times. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Is your heart troubled today? Man, I don't know about you, but I tell you what, it's just a lot of stuff. With, what's going on? I try to stay away from the news media because the more you get around that thing, the more you get troubled in your heart. Oh, I wish this side would win. Then you, Both sides are messed up. Either side is wrong. Uh, it doesn't ever bother you that, I mean, there's uh, 100 senators and it's always like 50 to 50 or 48 to 52 or something. How come it's never like 75 to 25 or 90 to 2? How come it's never that way? I think the thing is rigged from start to finish, but, but you can't prove it, and, and, it's, and, who, and at that level, who could really care anyways? But there's trouble sometimes. This isn't a political message, by the way, but uh, if you're trusting in, in the political arena, you're trusting the wrong thing. Amen. That thing will never get you out of trouble. That'll never. You know, I thank God we live in a country called America. I, there is not another place on the face of this planet I would not want to live in other than America. I've been to a lot of the other places. I just really don't appreciate none of them. Uh, I, I'm amazed that people live there and that they like it. That's fine. Uh, but they're always trying to get to America for some reason. And we're not perfect by any shape, form, or fashion. But, boy, I've been able to live uh, 60. I turned 65 yesterday. I've been able to live 65 years here and enjoy it. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff I've been privileged to do uh, that I know for a shadow, beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord gave me the opportunity to do it. A lot of people will say, well, I don't get the opportunity. You're not looking. Right. You're not looking. Or you're, you're, you're burning bridges as fast as you can. Things that trouble us. Have you ever wondered what some things that trouble you? I know it troubles most people, and it's, it's failures. Uh, we fail in life, and, and our past failures will eat us up. you got to get to the place where you just blow. Paul says, uh, forgetting those things which are behind. you got to forget those failures back there. Uh, I tell you what, guess what, there is some, there's some uh, successes back there, too, that you can't always live on everything in the past. Those things, they will tear you up. What troubles us? I was sitting there going, well, there's got to be an illustration. I like my Bible because my Bible will self-illustrate everything. Uh, if you look for an illustration, it won't take you very minute. I like the book of Ruth. Ruth is probably the coolest book and one of the coolest books in her Bible. Uh, here's an old lady. Uh, she goes down to Moab. She's married when she goes down there. She has two sons, which you and everybody's blessed. And so, oh, man, it's great. 
The problem is, is a little trouble came in the nation of Israel and a famine came in the land and there was no bread and, and her, her husband takes off. I'm not saying Ruth did it or, Mo, or Naomi did it, but her husband took off and goes down and runs to a place where he thinks there's food. While he's down there, it says right there uh, in uh, Ruth chapter 1 verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, this is back in the book of Judges, uh, that there was a, a famine in the land and a certain man of uh, Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. I mean, any man that had a couple sons back then, he's doing good because now you got three of you, you can go work in the field and you can do it. And it says, and the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons was Malon and Chilon, uh, Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there, and they took them wives of the uh, women of Moab the name of the one was Orpah, Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. So it wasn't a, a little bit of time they were there. They, they were supposed to just sojourn, and all of a sudden they dwell, start dwelling. Uh, you know, a lot of times the Lord will say, go somewhere and do this, and just go for a moment or go do this. And pretty soon we get really comfortable. People ask me all the time, how would you get to Ohio? My wife. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm, I'm thinking about this story. I said, Man, this is like the same thing that happened to me. I said, I was in Pensacola, Florida. I was going to go to the mission field and die on the mission field. And, and that's what everybody does. That's what you always thought, that that's what was going to happen. And my wife said, can we go back to Dayton and just stay there for just a couple days so I can say bye to my mom and dad? That was in 94. <laughs> that's been a while, brother. This has been a long time. Man, them two, two ladies, Ruth must have had a really hold on her husband. And so did Malon, his wife, uh, Orpah. But anyways, they dwelled there about 10 years. And Malon and Chalon died, and also both of them, and the women was left of her two sons. Your past failures. I bet you Ruth looked back in there, or, or Naomi looked back there, and she realized, she said, man, we should have never came here. We should have never came there. Uh, I got a little saying. There, there are two kinds of discontents in the world. Are you discontented today? There's only two kinds. Uh, he goes, the discontent that works and, and the discontent that wrings their hands. <laughs> you know, you're going to be discontent. You might as well just do something to make a few bucks if you're going to be discontented. The first gets what it wants. The second loses what it had. There is no uh, cure for the first but success. You know, if you're discontent and you work, eventually you'll work yourself out of being discontent. You can work yourself into contentment if you get up and work. You know what's wrong with our nation today? Nobody wants to work. They don't want to do anything anymore, man. They're just sitting there. It's troublesome times. Uh, you sit there and look at all the young people, and they think it's going to be, you're going to make a million bucks. What are you going to do when the bottom falls out? All this stuff and this easy money that's flowing all over the place, as soon as the bottom falls out, man, it's all gone. It, it just dries up quickly. It goes away. It's like down at the thrift store. I mentioned that during Sunday school. I go down there, and you used to have junk all over the place. And I, you, the people that come down there that sell the stuff are complaining because it's slim pickings anymore. You know what? You can always tell in a corporation when it's getting ready to go down the tubes. You say, how? They quit giving you free coffee. Now, I like free coffee. I like coffee. And every job I ever had when the company was about ready to go out of business, all the little amenities that they would give you to keep you there, they no longer give you that stuff anymore. They start taking it away. And, they, and pretty soon, you don't, they give you this liquid coffee. In this, you add water to it, and I'm like, what is that? Oh, they're trying to get rid of you is what they're trying to do. But the first will get what it wants with success. I've watched people who are miserable uh, become very successful. But your past failures, Naomi is sitting here, and she's down in Moab all by herself. And says, let not your heart be troubled. Have you ever thought that when your heart is troubled, you, you ought to do something to get out of it? Uh, there, if you stop and look back into your past somewhere and say, how in the world did I get to a place where I've got a troubled heart? I, you know, I don't ever look at our government as, as being uh, something that causes me a troubled heart. I don't look at anything. I don't even look at anybody around me. I was the one who caused everything in me that caused me to have problems. It's me. It's nobody else. I've had preachers before say, would you quit blaming yourself? I'm not going to blame. Quit that. I like taking the blame. I figured if you take the blame, bend over and get your spank. I had a fifth grade teacher, Mr. Crady. I wish y'all could have met him. He was the greatest guy in the whole world. He's still, he's one of my heroes of the faith. <laughs> he was a saved man, by the way. And uh, he would get us up in the classroom, and he would beat the snot out of us, man. I mean, I needed it. My dad needed it. If I got whooped at church, at, at church <laughs> if I got whooped at school, Overdell School, when I got home, I got whooped for my dad. 
That's just a deal, man. Mr. Crady was a good man. He called my dad and told him he whooped me. And, and you'd sit in class, and Mr. Crady would get you up against the, his desk, and his desk you know, was about this high, and you'd bend over like this. And he'd take a paddle. I mean, this guy was like 7 foot 10 or something, man. I mean, he, I, he'd probably, he looked like, he's probably Goliath. He's probably Goliath's brother. But he'd take his paddle, man, and he'd rear this thing back. I mean, like this. And he'd hit you, and he'd drive you through the wall. And you'd stand there like this. And if you stood here just like this and never moved, he'd hit you once. Bam! Bam! And he'd, then he'd just like, like that. And you'd never feel the next two. If you, you even, if you premeditated that spank or you hesitated, you did this, you just jerked a little. I mean, he nailed you three times. You know what he was teaching you? To take your licks. Take it like a man. Suck it up, buttercup. You were the one who did it. You pay, you do the crime, you pay. What's that, how's that word? You do the, you know, you pay the fine, you do the crime. Yeah, you do the time. And, and then, then, then on top of that, see, you don't have chivalry anymore, man. Men are not men. I don't care what anybody says. The men today are not men. You know what Mr. Grady taught us? He taught us how to be a man. Fifth grade, he said, a little girl, can one of these little girls, see, look at him. Stand up, Hannah. Look at it. Look at everybody. Yeah, just, yeah, I'm serious. Look at him. Doesn't she look sweet and kind? Look at her. No, don't turn around. Do, do, the, do, the, do, do the princess wave and all that stuff. Anyways, if a girl in class got in trouble, what grade are you in? Fourth, you're close. You stand up. This would be my fifth grade class next year. If she, now you would never think she gets in trouble, but boy, them little girls get in trouble. <laughs> don't you think they don't cause trouble? They cause trouble. But anyways, if they get in trouble and they want to get, going to get spankings, just like we got, if a man wanted to come up there, he could do the same thing. He could take their licks for him. You know what he's teaching us? How to, how to open a door for a woman. I tell these girls all the time, if a guy won't open that door for you, you don't even want him. Just get away from him. He's, he's a scumbag. If he won't open the door when you walk through, then you don't need him at all. Why? Because he's never learned what the value of a good woman is. You know what? Naomi's a, a very valuable woman. She's a good woman. And her husband could trust her, and she would go down to Moab with her husband at, at, a, at a drop of a hat, and she goes down, and everything bad goes, troublesome times hit her. And she didn't quit. There, when I was a young man, I observed, now this is another thing I read. When I was a young man, uh, uh, Bernard, uh, Bernard, Bernard Shaw wrote this. George Bernard Shaw. He says, when I was a young man, I observed that nine out of ten things I did were failures. You ever feel like that? Now, you could take this back the other way. There's two kinds of discontents in the world. A discontent that works and a discontent that, it, that, that right uh, wrings his hand. George Bernard, George Bernard Shaw wasn't one of the, the first, second kind. He says, when I was a young man, I observed that nine out of ten things I did were failures. Did you ever hate somebody always telling you you're wrong? Have you ever thought that maybe you are? <laughs> Has it ever even thought, entered into your little mind that you are the problem? Man, I had some great guys. Uh, Ken Tyree Firestone, the guy who, Ken Tyree, go down to Kentucky, man, in Louisville. There's about 47 Ken Tyree Firestones down there. And the guy owned all of them. And I, I did something wrong one day, and, and I had an excuse for everything. If you come to me, I have an excuse. I think you ought to have excuses. A book of excuses, I could write one. And he called me in his office, and I did something really, really bad, man. I, I, left, I left the oil out of a car, and the guy drives off, drives off. And he calls me up and says his car's ticking all over the place. Well, I, mean, I would imagine that. And I go down, I put oil in, put the plug. I left the, the oil filter off, and it drained. I thought that was kind of funny when I looked in the garage floor. I mean, here's five quarts of brand-new oil, like, on the ground. And there's no car in the, in the bay. I'm like, man, I wonder how that, somebody spilled some oil there, man. And uh, I left the oil filter off the car, and as soon as he started up, he just drained all five quarts right on the ground, and he drove, drives off. So Mr. Towery calls me in his office, and, and I give him all kinds of excuses. And he goes, Mike, have you got an excuse for everything? That stunned me. Nobody had ever said that to me. And I thought, is that how I present myself to everybody around me? Is uh, I got an excuse because of this? Have you ever thought that maybe, just maybe, I'm the problem? Have you ever thought that maybe, just maybe, some slim, very small, I know some slim chance, you're the problem? You ever thought about that? Have you ever thought that if you take the blame for the problem, the problem just goes away? Or do we want to carry this thing on for like two days or three months? I've seen people carry things on for two or three months. Past failures. Naomi is in a place where she's in a failure. 
And she now has two young ladies with her. And every day she wakes up realizing that she's in a place she doesn't belong. You know, when you're away from God, that's exactly what you are. You're in a place you don't belong. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. It was not made for us. Anybody that goes to hell, you're going to be out of place, man. You don't belong there. Nobody belongs there. God didn't make that for us. And the way he made it way out of us is to get out of it. So your past failures is troublesome. Troublesome times. you got to get away from your past failures. Then you get into present circumstances. You know, we got some present circumstances. I got all these myself, too. Nobody gave them to me. All the peas, man. There's a bunch of peas here. The present circumstances. They all came to me in the night in a vision of a dream. Oh. Ruth, Ruth 1.12 says this. Turn again, my daughters. Ruth, um, uh, Naomi finally says, look, I, I need to get back to where I came from. Sitting down here in Moab is just not the place for me. I need to get back. There's trouble sometimes back here. There's trouble here. There's trouble. Ruth is like, um, Naomi's like that first lady, or the first person. Uh, she, she is experiencing bad things too, but she's going to figure out how to get out of it. She's not going to just stay there. She's going to be discontent. She's discontent down there. I'm discontent all the time. Discontent is part of my life, discontentment. Uh, you should, you know, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I don't know about you, but I'm just not really happy here. And there's nothing down here except my wife and some friends and you guys, the church, that makes me happy. I love my mom, but she don't make me happy. She's Catholic. She wants to stay Catholic. I want her to go back to Kentucky. And you say, well, that's mean and cruel. No, it's just that I chose Jesus. I choose Jesus. I like Jesus. Uh, she, she's Catholic. I hate somebody who says, well, you're Catholic and I'm Baptist. Or I'm Methodist and you're this. No, I'm a Christian. What are you? I chose, I don't care whether my, 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 my leaning is Baptist, but I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm Christian first. I like, I'm on Jesus. I choose Jesus, even if I'm discontent. I would rather choose, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. But if I can have Jesus and silver and gold, I'll take that too. But if I can't, I'd rather have Jesus. Why? Because I know he'll get me through. And one of these days, I keep going, man, I said, Lord, I mean, we're looking at milliseconds. You know what a nanosecond is? A nanosecond, if I had a flashlight, if you took a, 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 a lady's physicist, stead, if you take two goalposts, you're standing on a football field, and you're standing at one, now light travels 186,000 miles per second. So if you're standing on, at one goalpost and you take a flashlight and you go click, the amount of time it takes the light to get from this goalpost to that goalpost is a nanosecond. That's pretty quick. It's a billion nanoseconds in a second. That's how many nanoseconds it is. But when I sit there and look at my life, I said, Lord, eternity. How long is eternity? It's like forever. And how long is my life? Okay, I can make it. I can make it. Just 70, 80 years, I can do it. I'm 65 now. That's encouraging. That means I only got five or ten years left, and I'm out of here, man. And, and I'm telling you what, if you think that I'm going to say, oh, let me stay to hell. No, I'm, I'm not that spiritual. I will stay if he makes me, but, boy, if he gives me an opportunity to go, I'm gone. Why? Because there's something out there that's much better. Guess what? I'll never be discontent there. I'll never be sad there again. I'll never be lonely there again. I'll never be hurting there again. I'll never be like uh, Naomi here down in Moab with my husband died and two kids died. And back then for a woman, for that to happen to her, there's no hope for her. And now she has two other ladies with her that she has to take care of. I can't even imagine a uh, mom with, with some kids with no help, how she would take care of those kids. It's an amazing thing in our society today. We have all kinds of stuff, but you get into some of these other countries, they don't have this stuff. Present circumstances. What is the present circumstance right now in the story we're reading with, with Naomi, one twelve? She's sitting there realizing she has to go back, and she gets her two daughters, and she says, Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I, too, am old. I, I am too old to have a husband. She ain't going to ever get married again. If I should say I have hope, if, if I should have a husband also tonight and she got pregnant and, she, and, and should bear sons, would you tarry? No, you won't tarry. You're not going to tarry 18 years till these kids get old enough for you to marry them. And matter of fact, they're probably not going to want you at 18 and you're 50-something. So you can hang that one up. Uh, I'm like, these kids are, you know, so they ain't going to have them. Go back and, and, and find you two men your age and get married and, and raise a family and go to your gods. 
That was her present circumstance. Your present, I wrote this in, your present circumstances don't determine where you can go. They merely determine where you start. Your, your condition right now, quit looking at your past failures. Quit going back there. There's nothing back there. Start right here. Say, look, I can start. I've talked to people 70, 80 years old. I said, all you got to do is start today. Mrs. Buffett, man, was a, I told you that story time and time again. I mean, a lady, 82 years old, gets saved. She wasn't going to get saved. She thought that there was no hope for her. She said, you don't know what I've done. Don't care. what. Don't tell me what you've done, by the way. I don't want to know. I don't know why everybody wants to know what everybody else does. All it does is it makes you think better or less of them. And chances are they've done stuff that you're going to think less of them anyways. In our society, you can't get by with doing anything anymore that it ain't wrong. I mean, everything is wrong. I was down in Florida. And everything, CBD, 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 pot, you know, drugs. I mean, store after store after store after store in Jacksonville, Florida. And then somebody said, well, Tennessee's like that too. Well, Dayton is, I wanted to go in one of the stores. I used to, you know, a long time ago. Uh, I wanted to go and just see what's in there, man. Do they have pot plants growing? What do they got in these places? Why do we think it has to be legal? But that's where our nation's gone to. You're in some trouble, troublesome times. Our young, people, our young people are being trained at such a rate to go the wrong way that another 15, 20 years of the Lord tarries, it's going to be a mess. There's just no way. You'll never recover. Noah's, it says, as it was in the days of Noah. It'll never recover. It cannot. You cannot make them go back. You can get one here, one through, but the masses, the masses, the sheer masses are going to go the wrong way. In Noah's day, eight people got on that ark. And I've had, I've had mathematicians say there could have been billions, if not trillions, of people on the planet at that time. And they all died, just like God took them all out. Why? Could God not say, yeah, he's powerful. The blood that Jesus shed at Calvary could save them all. But the problem is they didn't want it. And once you get a group of people in the masses, that's why you, you need to stay away from masses as much as you possibly can. Get a city. Dayton's big enough for me. I, don't, I come from Louisville. Louisville's a little bit bigger than Dayton. Cincinnati, you keep it, man. You cannot make those people happy. You cannot. I've said in Sunday school, most churches out there, that get people in, and they're trying to keep people in, and then they start doing everything. Oh, I'll give them this job, give them that job, give them this job, give them the work, 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 work. And all you're doing is you're just trying to appease everybody to keep them. I don't like that at all, man. You know what I thought? I've, my whole motive since we've started this church is to run you off. <laughs> I figured if you all all leave, then I'm done. My job is finished here. And I could go on doing what I want to do. You know what has happened? I said, here's a book. I don't even have to make this stuff up. I just read what the book says. The best I can, I just read what the book says. I said, man, this will offend all kinds of people. I like that stuff, man. This is good stuff right here. This will get them. This will get them. You got to do what God says. That will get them. They'll walk out the door. And you guys keep coming. Man, that is messed up. You know what that makes me do? I have to stay now because you're here. That means I have to get some better messages. <laughs> but, but the present circumstances, just because... You're in a mess right now. You don't have to stay there. They just merely start. Man, Mrs. Buffin, I went down there and talked to her at the hospital that day, and, and she sits there, and she says, Mike, you don't know what I've done. You just don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. I said, Mrs. Buffin, it don't matter. I said, wouldn't it be a blessing, man? Here you are, 82 years old, and you die right now. And she died uh, two days later or two weeks later, something like that. Well, she, it wasn't very long. And I said, wouldn't it be a blessing? The devil had you her, your whole life. Had you. And you know he's had you. She goes, yeah. She goes, and I said, at the very last minute, Jesus saves your soul. And all you got to do is ask. You got to get over your foolish pride. Only by pride come in contention. Your problem is here, not with me. I don't really care. I said, you get up there, man, you get there in the last minute. I don't care. I said, I think it's a good thing to get in the last minute. I think it's a great thing to go to heaven. I think it's a bad thing to go to hell. I don't know if anybody agrees or disagrees, but I, I do. I think the other option is just not something I choose. I don't like that. I talked to my mom. I said, Mom, if you died, and best of them, I said, I said, do you know if sure you, she goes, she points down. Now, she could be saved, but she points down every time I talk to her. Yet she will not let go of the things in her past to be able to, to grasp the present and set her de destination for the future. She cannot do that. She refuses to do it. And I'm like, that is the craziest thing in my mind is why would somebody do that? Naomi makes perfect sense to me. She's down there. Her husband's gone. Everything's gone. She's lost everything. The best thing she could do is get back to where she came from, and that's home. 
but her land's already been sold. Everything's been taken. Now, she has nothing to go back to, but she knows that's the place to go to. I'm going to go back home. She tells her, her two daughter-in-law, says, go back and find something. Prospects, projected prospects. You know, that lady had absolutely nothing, but in Ruth 115, it says, and she said, behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. She's just given the girl, uh, Ruth, some good advice. She said, Ruth, there's men here in your land uh, that are like-minded, that think like you and I. And she goes, no. She goes, Naomi, they don't think like me. She said, you done messed me up. <laughs> she goes, I'm starting to think like you now. And I don't think like the people in Moab no more. You know what Ruth did? She had a convert. You know, a lot of people, we don't have converts in life. And, and, and the only way you can ever tell a real true convert is by what they say. You have to listen to them. Naomi uh, Orbro already went back. She wasn't a convert. She went back. She didn't have a problem. Ruth, Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee, talking to Naomi, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Naomi, I know you have nothing for me. I know you. She's hospitable. She goes, I know you have nothing for me. I know you can't give me a thing. You cannot get pregnant. You're well past that. And unless you, even if you did, uh, that, that child wouldn't be mine. And it's a 50-50 shot. It's going to be a girl anyway. So it won't work. And he goes, entreat, not, uh, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. I want to be there with you. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Uh, thy people shall be my people and my God and your God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried, right next to you. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw she was steadfast uh, minded to go with her, then she left her speaking, and she said, I'm going home. You know what, Ruth, the, Ruth and Naomi are a, are a good pair of people. A man wants to lead. You know what? You always see people. Everybody wants to be in front of a crowd. They want to be able to do the preaching. They want to be able to do the song leading. They want to be doing all this other stuff. But, you know, in an orchestra, have you ever been to an orchestra, a real good one? I mean, a uh, Philharmonic one, the guy sitting down there, but he turns his back on the crowd. If you're ever going to get to a place where you really do something for God, you're going to have to turn your back on the crowd. You're not going, you're not going to be able to do for God what you need if you're looking at the crowd. The instruments are all down here. Man, we did went to the Nutcracker. Brother Jonathan gave me a set of tickets. I was hurting, man. What was I hurting? I was broke. Oh, yeah, I broke my three ribs falling off the ceiling over here. George, thanks, George. Thanks, George. George didn't care one bit. He was laughing at me on the ground right here, just laughing. Yes. <laughs> this platform wasn't here, and we were on concrete floor, and I was putting, uh, readjusting him light, and, and I was on a scaffolding all the way up, and George kept saying, lock it. You better lock it. You better lock it. You better lock it. Now, don't ever get around that guy and, and expect any compassion from him for you at all. He has zero for anybody. But he, I mean, he's right. He did tell me. He, he loves his wife. He'll, he'll take care. He has lots of compassion for her. Anybody else, you're, you're pretty much toast. And I fall and hit the ground, and I'm, I'm bouncing off the scaffolding all the way down, and I'm breaking ribs as I'm going down and cracking them. And I can't even breathe. I'm laying on the, I'm, I'm out of breath on the ground. I'm dying. <laughs> and George is sitting there, I told you so. <laughs> told you so. He didn't even call 911. He did not care. He was like, I told you. I'm right. You're wrong. I told you that. And I, get, I just got so mad, man. I'm so mad. Uh, uh, I, almost, I didn't cuss. But you know what? I got back up on the scaffolding. I finished what I was doing. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I wasn't going to let him. I, I wasn't going to do it, man. He's going to tell his story for the rest of life, but he's going to say at least he got back up like a man. Got back up there and finished the job. That was stupid. But, <laughs> but, but a man he, who wants to lead an orchestra, he has to turn around. You got you to let go of the crowd. You got to do it. Naomi knew that she needed to get back to her home. She's in the far country. The, the beginning of getting anything right is you know where you're at. you got to know it. She knew she's in the far country. She could have stayed down there. I'm sure the people down there liked her. Uh, uh, Oprah and, and Naomi, or uh, Ruth's family probably would have helped taking care of her. Uh, she lost everything. I mean, she lost her husband or two sons. She lost it all. She had no way of getting it back. Uh, you know the danger for an old person to invest in a nation like ours? I mean, you could lose everything you got. Most old people are, are wise. They keep, they keep what they got in safe places because they only got a short time. You just can't gain it back. If I was 20 years old, I can gain all kinds of stuff back. 
At 50 years old, you can probably get some of it back too. But man, the time you get up to 65, 70 years old, you make a bad financial decision and it's going to cost you. Naomi knew that. She had lost everything. There was no hope of her getting anything back. And she was trying to take care of those two girls. And she had no way, had no way of caring for Ruth. Yet Ruth impressed her to the place where she said, I want to be with you and your God. And you know, sometimes a younger person will encourage an older person to do the right thing. I was sitting down there and they were, they're all preaching on faith. Faith, 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 which is good. 40-something messages, 44, 45, 43, whatever. And I started listening to the young guys. And a lot of them just said the same thing. They said, please, you old guys. They surely was talking about other people, not me. But you old guys, hang in there, man. Hang in there for us. Hang in there for us. We need to see you finish the job. We need, that's what I kept hearing over and over again. And the Lord says, so you want to quit? I said, yeah, I want to quit. I think it's time for me to quit. All the other old people quit. Why can't I quit? I finally got Social Security. I'm up, to, I'm up to the old people status. I said, I, how many churches have I ever been in that all the old people think I can just sit down and do nothing now? In other words, yeah, but they were trained wrong. You weren't trained wrong. You know better than that. I said, I know. He goes, Mike, I had to stick it out for you. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, uh, you did, Lord. And he goes, look at Paul, man. Paul had to go to the, you haven't been in prison cell yet getting your head cut off. I said, yeah, yeah, it's true. All you got to do is live another 10, 15 years. He goes, and I'll come back and get you, and it'll be well done now, good and faithful service. Okay, 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 I'll do it. And you start listening to these young kids, man, these young, when I say young kids, I'm talking about 25, 30, 35-year-old young men. I had a bunch of them come up and shake my hand and said, brother, thank you for being faithful over the years. You come down here, and you bring your family and your church down here to this meeting, and you, you continually are here every year. We look for you. Last year, when Elizabeth had her baby, me and Beth, we got down there on a Thursday, on a Wednesday we got to go to the Wednesday night services, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, I got a set of airplane tickets because Elizabeth had to go into labor while we're down there. And, and Beth is not going to stay down there. She would walk home, and she'd walk very fast. She'd have been home before Elizabeth had that baby. Uh, she'd hitchhike. I mean, Beth would have got home. I, I don't, so I got a plane tickets, and we got out there. I called Dr. Peacock. I said, hey, we got to go. And we came back up here. This year, uh, she came down there and had the baby with her. So I said, here's my excuse. Here's my excuse. It's like a teacher's note. I said, there it is right there. I had people come and say, we missed you last year because you weren't here. You never know what somebody's doing when they're watching you. You never know. You think that your, your tr troublesome times will sometimes put you in a place where you think that nobody's watching me and woe is me and all this, and people are watching exactly what you're doing. And you just got, you know what you got to do? Whether it feels good, who cares? You just keep on going on. If the Lord told you what to do, you just do what he told you to do and just keep going. You know what Naomi did? She did what the Lord told her to do. She said, I'm going home. I have nothing back there at home. There's no land for me back there at home. There's, and I, I've got to take Ruth with me, and I've got to feed, find a way to feed her. You know what the prescription? How about that, man? You got that, all them peas? Aren't they, isn't that cool? Past failures. Present circumstances. The projected prospects, the prescription. You know what the prescription for a troubled heart is? You got a troubled heart today? I'll tell you what it is. It's belief. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You know what solved my uh, troubled heart 43 years? Beth keeps telling me 42. I like 43 sounds better. She keeps saying it's only 42. That's a good wife. She always corrects you. You got to let her do it. So 42 years ago, I was sitting on a back porch, and I was reading my Bible two, three, four weeks before that, maybe five weeks, a month. Who knows? I don't know how long. It's been a long time. You get old and you start forgetting that stuff. It just, it just sounds good. You pre keep preaching. It gets longer and longer and longer. But, <laughs> but I sit there and said, Lord, I said, I remember back there when I thought there was no hope. And I didn't really know who you were like I do today. I didn't know you back then like that. I said, and I thought there was no possible way, no way for me to get into heaven. And you're sitting up in heaven looking down saying, what an idiot. <laughs> Look at that. He thinks that I didn't die for him, but I did. That's like Mrs. Buffin. He died for her, and she got saved at 82, and I got saved at 22. And it doesn't matter when you get saved as long as you get saved. You only got one chance in this life to get saved, and that's why you're breathing. You got that whole life to do it, and you don't know. It's a point that a man wants to die. Guess what? Brother Joe told me about a, 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 an acquaintance of his, a friend of his, of the family that passed away at 40 years old up there where he's from. You don't know when that. My nephew died at 13. My sister died at 33. My other sister died at 39. You have no idea. 
I have no idea. I, I don't know why I'm still here. I should be dead, some of the things I went through. But, but Naomi knew she needed to get back. She had no way of caring for herself. She had no way of caring for Ruth. But she still had to go back. You know what she did? She trusted God. It's better to be where God wants you to be than to be rich in a place where you shouldn't be. You know what another dollar will do? Another dollar will get you wanting another dollar. Now, if God gives you money, that's a totally different thing. That's totally different. But if you're running after a dollar, you'll never find all of them you want. You'll never find them. If God gives you, like Barzillai or one of them guys, if he gives you those dollars, you can be like Barzillai or you can be like Nabal. One of the two, if you know the story. This guy was willing, rich, both of them are rich. This guy was willing to help any chance he got. This guy didn't want to give nothing to nobody. And God killed this guy. And this guy lived past, at least past 80. He had COVID, by the way. He couldn't see, he couldn't taste, he couldn't smell, he couldn't hear. That's, that's all the symptoms of COVID. They had it back then. Everybody blaming China for COVID, man. It was back in the Bible. But here's 80 years old, man. He's still serving God. Prescription for a troubled heart is just belief. You know what, man? I've, I've had a troubled heart. I've had trouble over the years, but boy, I tell you what. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I can say that now. I couldn't say that way back then. Now that I got him, I'm like, Lord, you know all the troubles I've been through life? You got troublesome times are here. I'm sitting there going, man, I'm, I'm saying all the stuff I went through, I can see your hand in that thing everywhere, and I see it. And, and I can't, boy, I wish I could, I tell you what, I wish I could produce Jesus Christ right here. I wish I could take out of my heart my salvation and just give it to you. I do it. You know why? I know how to get it right back. I get down and I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But he doesn't, allow, he doesn't work that way. He never has worked that way. He never will. You know what he wants? He wants us to come to him with a believing heart and ask him for salvation. He's already done it all. All the rest of it has been done. The cross of Calvary, he built the universe so he could put a planet called Earth in the middle of this thing. He built the Milky Way. So he could put the earth and the, our solar system in the Milky Way. He put a planet called Earth out there and put a sun running around. There. Look at all he's done to get you to heaven. Then he came down here and died on a cross at Calvary 2,000 years ago to open that. He said over in John chapter 10, I am the door. If you got any questions about who it is, he goes, I'm it. All you got to do is say, Lord, show me. And you know what he'll do? He'll start, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the, he'll start showing you little stuff. Little bit. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, not perish, not perish, not perish, not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting, everlasting, eternal life, eternal life, eternal life. That's forever. That's forever. How do I get that? How can I? And then you get over to 1 John and it says that you may know you have eternal life. Wait a minute. Somebody can know it. Somebody can get it, and somebody can know it. Well, you can't know. You ever heard somebody say, you can't know if you, when you die you're going to go to heaven? I can it says right there, somebody can. Why can't I be that somebody? Have you ever come to your Bible like that and said, why can't I be like that? I want to be like Moses, man. I, why, why choose some? Why be a Judas? I don't want to be a Judas. I, I don't want to be a Balaam. I don't, I don't mind talking to the ass, but if, if I'm going to talk to a donkey, I want to be able to at least reason with a donkey and change. Balaam never changed. I want to be like somebody who changes. I want to be like Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Man, don't you think that would be cool to be thrown in a fiery furnace and not burn up? And you're looking out of the fiery furnace and all the flames are going all over the place and you're, it's not affecting you one bit. And yet you look out there and there's two or three soldiers out there all crispy crittered, man, because they threw you in there. I'm thinking, man, that's cool, man. And the Lord says, yeah, you got to go back out there. But I don't want to go. Can I just say, no, no, no. Don't feel bad. I call, I'm going to call another guy up here, Paul, uh, down the road a ways, and I'm going to send him back too. Don't worry about it, man. You'll be back here with me soon. The prescription is belief. You know, belief, thou shalt believe. If the, the Philippian jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the hardest thing you'll ever do is learn how to believe on him? And, and be, I mean believe it. Not just say it. We, we say words, words, words. We just say stuff sometimes. But I mean, do you really believe? Do you really believe today that Jesus Christ died for you on a cross 2,000 years ago and shed his blood at Calvary? You know what, you know what uh, Naomi did? Naomi believed. Now, she did, Christ wasn't there. And she didn't have a way of, of producing Jesus Christ, but she knew that back in the land, that's where she belonged. And she goes back here. And to make a long story short, I'm done. Boaz was sitting back here, had a big field. And Boaz is just as, Naomi knew he was her kinsman, but nobody's going to help me. She didn't go back for that. 
she went back to die in her land. And Ruth got back there and she said, look, man, we got to have some food and you're too old to work, but I can go out and work. I'll go out in one of these fields and I'll just start gleaning. And gleaning means that as the reapers come through, they just drop stuff or they don't get everything. I mean, we're talking nothing, almost nothing. You have to go out to get anything. It's a lot of work. And she goes out and just so happens that the Lord puts her. She trusts in the Lord. See, where belief comes in, it comes in little by little. And all of a sudden, you can trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thy understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. We got a, a, a message the other day, yesterday, that a young lady and, and uh, one of the missionaries' daughters was abducted. And I'm like, man, that's, that's, chances are that's going to end bad. And I'm down and I'm reading uh, Ian Bounds' book on prayer. You know why? Because I heard one of the young guys down here say that it was one of the, I never knew that that was actually a requirement to go through school. Uh, Dr. Rubin never made that a requirement for us to read it. So I have a brand new copy, never been opened, man. Said, uh, you know, the full works of Ian Bounds. And I go through all my books and I finally find it and I got sitting there. I've been reading it and I'm, I'm a chapter, chapter eight or nine or something like that. And it was like the Lord saying, you going to pray for that little girl? You're reading a book on that. <laughs> Don't you think you should pray? I said, sure, man. I said, that's a good idea, Lord. I said, because that, that, I, I know the brother. He's over there and his wife. And I said, they're probably in turmoil right now. I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine that. And I said, Lord, I mean, if you could. 15 minutes later, Beth comes down here and says, oh, they found the girl. Now, I, don't, I know it's not my prayer. But boy, it sure does make me feel good that, that the Lord would say, hey, you going to pray, you idiot? At least you can feel like you're part of the solution and not part of the problem. I'm sitting there going, man, I said, that was a quick answer. He goes, yeah, I answer a lot of yours quick. I never had to hear that she was, but they found her. I'm sitting there going, in a foreign country, and I don't know the status of her, but they found her. They said, you have not because you asked not. And when you ask, you ask a miss. I said, Lord, I didn't ask a miss. I was thinking about a little girl and her mom and dad. And I said, I know I got four daughters, and I just thought about them for a minute. And boom, the thing, I'm telling you what, to me, that stuff, it just marvels me when I see stuff like that. Oh, that's just a coincidence. I don't know. Maybe it is. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm always going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Naomi, Naomi got back, and, Moab, and, and Boaz was there, and Naomi happened to hap to light on the field that belonged to, uh, to she could have went over to Nabal's field, I guess. Nabal wasn't there, but somebody like him. But no, no, she gets on uh, that field, and the next thing you know, down the road a little bit, uh, her and Ruth and, and Boaz get together, and, and the next thing you know, eight, nine hundred years later, Jesus Christ is born. And that's the bloodline of Jesus Christ. And you say, how does God know that? He just does. And you and I don't. And sometimes troubles will come in our troubles, sometimes will come in your life, and they just do. And you just let them come, and they'll go. And they'll come, and they go. I worked with a guy one time. He said, stick around. He said, everything changes in every about every three or four years. And it does. That's our, our political system changes for the worse every three or four years. And it's going to continue to go that way. I got a Bible that says it's supposed to go that way. But you know what? I don't have to worry about that. I got a Lord that's taking care of me. Sometimes I'm sad. I know not why. My heart is sore distressed. It seems the burdens of the world have settled on my chest. Have they ever been there for you? They have for me. And yet I know, I know that God, who doth all things right, will lead me thus to understand to walk by faith, not sight. That's where we're at, brother. You got to learn how to walk, but trust Him. You got to trust Him. And this world is going to pull you off the side. Oh, that's fake and that's phony, and, and you can't believe Him. He says, um, And though I may not see the way He's planned for me to go, the way seems dark to me just, but oh, I sure He knows. He knows exactly which way you need to go. Today He guides my feeble steps, tomorrow, tomorrow's in His right, is in His sight. He asks, he, he has asked me to never fear, but walk by faith, not sight. Someday the mist will roll away. The sun will shine again. I'll see the beauty of the flowers, and then I'll know I'll grin. <laughs> Have you ever done that? Just started laughing. Because you watch the hand of God move away the clouds, and all this stuff goes away, and the sun starts coming. I like seeing clouds when they start dissipating, and you see those rays coming through. That's the coolest thing. Beth will go, I wonder if he's coming through one of those. He could, man. Actually, I think he's just, the whole thing is going to go away. I know, and I know my father's, uh, and I'll know my father's hand has led me uh, the way to light. 
because I placed my hand in his and walked by faith, not sight. You know, the, the title of this message was Troublesome Times. There's troublesome times, and they're going to be in our lives. You can't get away from it. And they're going to get worse. Uh, they'll get, well, I'm 65. They're going to get worse for me. They might get better for you. I have no idea. But in any case, I don't, work, I don't walk by what I see. I walk by what the Lord has said. And I know that 1980, I got saved. Can you know when you got saved? Do you know when you got saved? Because if you don't, and you're in here today, you're taking a chance. It's appointed that a man wants to die. You don't know when that day is. And like Mrs. Buffin, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go 15 seconds past today, the next minute. I wouldn't want to go 15 seconds past the next minute lost. If you're in this room today and you're lost, you know, it's simple. All you have to do is say, hey, can somebody show me out of the Bible how to get saved? It's simple. If thou, all you have to do is believe that Christ, he said, over in 1 Corinthians, says, Christ died for my sins. You've got to believe Jesus Christ. Believe. Not just say, Believe. I believe Jesus Christ lived 2,000 years ago. I don't have a problem with that. I believe he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. I don't have a... Man, I wish y'all could have been down in Florida with us, and we was at, at the place, and at uh, the zoo, and that lady was sitting there. And I went through this whole thing with her. And I said, ma'am, and she's an older lady, and she, she's Catholic, and I, I said, well, me and my wife are both ex-Catholics. We're Cap Captus or Batholics or one of them, somewhere in the middle there somewhere. We don't know where we're at. I said, and she's laughing. And, uh, and sometimes you just smooth the thing over, man, so you can get, it, get a track in her hand and, and you walk away. Sometimes that's all you're there for is to put a track in somebody's hand. You're not necessarily there to get them saved. You're there to put a track in their hand to get them a little closer to the Savior. That's all you're there for. It's not about me. It's about them. They're lost. They're the ones. And I said, ma'am, I said, do you believe? I said, look, I said, you're Catholic. She goes, yes. I said, I know exactly what you believe. I said, I used to be there, been there. I said, I quit at 13, but I said, I know exactly what you believe. I said, you believe Jesus Christ, I'm with him, I spilled. You believe Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago? Yes. I said, you believe you're a sinner? She goes, yes. I said, you believe he died for sinners? Yes. I said, you believe this? Blah, blah, blah. And I go through all this stuff. Then I take over Romans 10, 9, and 10. And I said, and right here it says, but if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart, people walking by hearing everything we're doing. And she, she, never, has, she never said, I got to go back to work. She stopped. She wanted to hear it. I said, it said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart. I said, have you ever asked Jesus Christ? She was, yes, I have. I was going to say, you liar. I said, oh, wait, when did you do that? And she gave us a perfect salvation testimony. She goes, you know, sometimes it's hard to leave what you've always been in. It's hard. She goes, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. You know, sometimes in our life it's hard to let go of this world. But the right thing is to trust, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. If silver and gold is what you want to have, one of these days you're going to die, and you can get all the silver and gold that you want. You can have it all, and it's not going to do you a bit of good. Because the day you die, it stays, and you go, and the Bible says it's appointed on a man once to die, but after this the judgment, and there's only heaven and hell. I chose heaven. Father, thank you for your blessings. Lord, I just thank you for the, the word of God. Thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for a Bible that shows us that troublesome times will be here. It's been, been all the way down through history. Lord, there's nothing new today. It may be new to us because we're not used to them, but Lord, uh, they're coming. And, and Lord, it's just part of life. But Lord, you're going to guide and direct our steps all the way through. And thank you for Naomi and Ruth, uh, Boaz, Lord, and, and all the rest of them that, as you come down through history. Lord, from the day you wrote this book up to today, thank you for every... Uh, story that's in this book, Lord, because it'll guide and direct us and it'll show us the picture of what we should be doing. And Lord, if there's somebody in here today that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, I just pray that you get them a little bit closer today. Lord, today would be a great day for them to get saved. And Father, we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen.